so much, Christoph, for that really kind introduction. Um, I'm afraid there's a plane flying overhead at the moment, but it will pass uh, the wonders of uh, Zoom and technology. Um, I just want to start by thanking Stefan and all of the organising committee for the very kind invitation to tell you about some of my group's latest work in electroactive frameworks. Um, but I also, uh, from all of us down under here in Australia and New Zealand, I also want to thank uh, Stefan, the organising committee and the DECAM team um, really for all of their help in trying to keep our community um, together uh, through this really trying time. Um, so Susumu has provided a really beautiful introduction actually to uh, the importance of electroactivity and conductivity in uh, metal organic framework materials. And so the, the work that I really want to talk to you about today is very much our interests and importance of, of understanding the fundamental aspects of charge transfer in these three dimensional materials. And of course, as Susumu also mentioned, if we can really harness this fundamental charge transfer applications, then we really have um, an inroads into a whole range of really important and exciting applications, all the way from energy storage and conversion devices, for example, batteries and supercapacitors, through to microporous conductors, smart windows, uh, the idea of exploiting these materials for electrical swing gas separations, electrochemical sensing, electrocatalysts, and so on and so forth. There are numerous uh, potential applications that we may have for these types of materials. Of course, the question is, there are already so many existing types of electroactive and, and conducting solids like conducting polymers, even purely organic materials like the, the well-known organic conductors like TTF, TCNQ, uh, porous carbons, graphitic carbons. And so the question is, what does a, a coordination framework really offer that perhaps some of these other materials may not, or what differs in, in terms of the properties that a coordination framework may offer for these types of applications. And I think from my perspective, I really think of these materials a little bit like a playground for the coordination chemist. And I think we've seen that from Sisu's um, phenomenal uh, foray uh, across the field. And of course, we all know very well the properties of these materials that, that give them their um, they're incredibly high surface areas, but what is quite interesting is that the majority of metal organic frameworks or many metal organic frameworks incorporate redox inactive metal centers like zinc, zirconium, aluminium. And so for the most part, they're typically uh, semiconducting or even insulating and only very, very few are really uh, highly conducting. Although as Susum has shown, many inroads have been made into that uh, in very recent years. So, one issue we have with electroactivity based on uh, the metal centres is that, of course, we know that coordination uh, compounds and, and metal ions have a preference for particular geometries uh, in certain redox states. So the work that my group have been doing has really been focusing on the use of electroactive ligands. And this is just uh, a small selection of the, some of the ones that we use in, in our group. We think very carefully about the electron donating and accepting ability of these ligands. And uh, for some of these, they're quite interesting in the sense that we can use different types of stimuli to really change the redox properties. So for example, the biologens, we can shine light on these ligands and alter the redox state. Um, same goes for the naphthalene diamides. So I'm going to talk about some of these um, electroactive ligands in the frameworks that I'll, uh, that I'll mention today. So just thinking really first about one pore of a, of a generic metal organic framework, and the exact framework doesn't matter so much here, but we can envisage, of course, a range of different types of charge transfer interactions. For example, metal to metal, ligand to ligand, or metal to ligand interactions. Of course, the, the beauty of the metal organic framework is the presence of these pores. And so we can also envisage host guest interactions as well. These interactions might be intrinsic to the framework backbone itself. But of course, if we apply some type of external stimuli like electrochemical potential or even chemical potential, electric field, magnetic field, or even just including um, some type of guest, then of course we can alter the properties of, of the framework itself. So this gives rise to not just uh, the, the, the intrinsic properties of the framework, but properties of the framework in each of its different 
uh, potential charge states. And the really intriguing question then is not just about these localised interactions, if you like, but also what happens when these charge transfer interactions occur over a long distance within the three-dimensional structure. And of course, the beauty of the Medellinic framework is the fact that it really does provide us with very exquisite control over the three-dimensional um, position of the atoms uh, within space. And of course, if we can generate this long range charge transfer, then of course you can imagine that we open up the possibility of conductivity. And I'm even aware there are some concerted efforts towards uh, perhaps the discovery even of superconductivity in metal organic frameworks. Of course, charge transfer can be through the backbone of the framework itself, or it can be through the pore space in terms of iron motion. And Susumu has just given us uh, the beautiful examples of, uh, of iron transport and proton conductivity, which occurs through the pores. So today I'm really gonna be focusing on the, the through backbone, um, charge transport, if you like, but it's really important to remember that in constant that we are gonna have iron diffusion in order to balance the charge of the material. So it is really important to say that this is such a rich um, and historically rich area of research. And I would argue that uh, as Susumu has already shown us a beautiful history of the field, but with regard to electroactive frameworks, I would probably argue this is an area that goes back some centuries. Um, and many of us would be familiar with this exquisitely blue coloured uh, framework material, not strictly a metal organic framework, uh, but it is a coordination polymer, if you like. This is Prussian blue, which is iron two and iron three centres linked by cyanide ligands in three dimensional coordination space. And this difference in charges, the mixed valency, if you like, gives rise to this very important intervalence charge transfer transition, which give, gives rise to an absorbance in the visible region and gives Prussian blue its beautiful blue coloration. And it's been used, of course, and prized for, for centuries as an ink and dye stuff. Um, it's used in Japanese artworks like the Great Wave of Kanagawa and Chinese pottery. Uh, and even the name blueprint originally comes from uh, the use of Prussian blue. A few more contemporary examples, and, and I've really cherry picked here and want to acknowledge the, the huge amount of work from many, many others doing exquisite work in this area. But a real milestone here from Alec Tallon and Mark Allendorf at Sandia where they show that if you place an electroactive ligand, in this case a TCNQ, inside what is a formerly redox inactive framework, then you generate, if you like, these little bridges that enable the framework to start conducting electricity. Um, and a very, very recent example, exquisite example from Mircea Dinkers group, where you have these nickel digloxmate uh, uh, ligands. These are stacked in three dimensional space. And this is actually a, um, a beautiful analogue of one of their frameworks based on tetrathiophulvaline. But here the metallo ligands are very close in space and this gives rise to semiconductivity in the material. So really with that said, where um, we got quite excited about this was the potential to probe electroactivity, but in real time, if you like. And so the work in my group has really been developing real-time uh, in situ solid state spectroelectrochemical probes for electroactivity. And here we work both on electrochemical methods, but also developing some new types of spectroelectrochemical methods. So if you like, this is a little bit like our toolbox uh, of techniques. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of, of how we do this, this is uh, an example of one of our first techniques, which is UVB's near infrared spectroelectrochemistry. And it's a very, very simple uh, method where we use a three electrode cell. The solid material is placed on the underside uh, of an ITO coated quartz electrode and we have a handheld spectrometer that simply images the surface of the working electrode as we apply a potential and we can then measure uh, the spectrum uh, as, we, as we change uh, that potential. So I wanted to give you an example of how we use these types of techniques and we've taken great inspiration from this historically rich area uh, known as the organic metals. A number of these types of materials are even superconducting and the idea is that we match the donor, in this case a tetrathiophulvaline, and the acceptor, in this case a TCNQ, and we, we match their potentials, if you like, 
And what is interesting about these purely organic materials is that they have very high conductivities, even on par almost with that for metallic copper uh, itself. So taking the inspiration from that idea of, of incorporating both donors, in this case TTF inspired ligand, and acceptors, in this case, naphthalene diamide inspired ligand into metal organic frameworks. Um, here's an example of a, of a donor acceptor framework. Uh, it actually has five accessible redox states, two as a result of the tetrathiphylene and two as a result of the naphthalene diamide. It is a semiconducting material. And if we now use our solid state spectroelectrochemical methods, what we see is that we can reversibly cycle between the plus one uh, and minus one states. If we try to move outside of this electrochemical window, then the whole material degrades. But what we do see in the UVB's near infrared spectroelectrochemistry is a charge transfer band, which you see here in the middle of the visible. So as soon as we apply a reductive potential, this collapses, but we can regenerate the starting state. And in fact, we can do the same experiment, the solid state spectroelectrochemistry with EPR, or electron paramagnetic resonance as well. And we see here in the black curve, two radicals, two overlapping radical signals from the TTF radical cation and the naphthalene diamide radical anion. So what we see here is that in the as synthesized state, we already have uh, a certain degree of charge transfer, which we can actually uh, model using uh, some computational chemistry uh, showing that uh, we already have the TTF in its radical cation state, the naphthalene diamide in its radical anion state. So really wanting to understand more about the intimate um, effects of electroactivity on these materials, here is a, a confocal Raman spectroelectrochemical method where we use a screen printed electrode and the, the metal organic framework here uh, sits on the working electrode and we bead a drop of electrolyte to complete the electrochemical cell. Uh, without wanting to labor this too much, what we essentially see in applying potential here is a change in the vibrational uh, frequencies for the TTF and naphthalene diamide that are consistent with the change in their redox state. Um, another really important method that I wanted to touch on briefly because it's been, uh, very important in our laboratory. For most of us working with uh, the electrochemistry of framework systems, we see very high capacitance of these materials, which can be used to great effect as the sumo showed us. Um, and these materials are often used as, uh, as super, uh, super capacitors. But one of the issues with high capacitance is it's very difficult often to see the Faraday processes. So if we use Fourier transform AC voltammetry, which is simply applying a sinusoidal frequency across the potential ramp, what we find is a little bit like uh, NMR spectroscopy, the Faraday processes simply fall out and we can actually observe them very clearly using the AC experiment and even model the kinetics of the charge transfer. So this has been a really important technique uh, to sort of complete our toolbox, if you like. So what I want to do now is just show you a, a couple of case studies, if you like, of how we have been trying to explore the fundamental aspects and mechanisms of charge transfer uh, using some of these techniques that I've just shown you. And we've taken a, a great deal of inspiration here from nature and uh, thinking a little bit about charge transfer mechanisms in solid state materials in general. If you think of, for example, the beautiful color of gemstones like sapphire or even minerals like hibonite, and this is a, a famous meteorite in Australia uh, that landed in Victoria in the late 1960s, or even the reaction center of photosystem too, these are all examples from nature that use to very good effect uh, this, uh, this property of mixed valency in order to achieve long range charge transfer and charge delocalization. So we've taken great inspiration from that in terms of how we might design metal organic framework materials that do indeed achieve uh, or have long range charge uh, delocalization. Of course, this might be intrinsic to the material itself or we might apply some type of external stimulus to stimulate that uh, charge transfer process. So here's uh, one of our first uh, materials using this type of design, and it's based on thiazole, thiazole ligand. Well, you'll notice that in the framework itself, 
we have these cofacial thiazolothiazole ligands. They're within pie stacking distance, 3.8 uh, angstroms, and the material is interdigitated, if you like. Um, so it doesn't leave uh, very much pore space. But interestingly, this cofacial arrangement is a little bit like uh, double glazed windows in a home. And if we reduce this metal organic framework, remembering that the thiazole thiazole um, can exist in either radical anion or dianion state, here we apply a reductive potential minus 1.75 volts. We see uh, the formation of these new bands in both the near infrared and visible region. And the compound correspondingly uh, changes to this dark forest green coloration. So these bands here in the visible are due to the radical uh, anion of the thiazole thiazole, and that's uh, conferred with uh, solid state EPR, spectroelectrochemistry. But this band in the near infrared is really quite interesting. And after uh, a great deal of work, what we were able to reason was that this was due to a through space uh, intervalence charge transfer process. And using single crystal absorption spectroscopy, so this is just a single crystal of the, the MOF that we can perform absorption spectroscopy on, we're able to use um, some various theories, uh, Marcus Hush theory being one of the the, the most predominant ones for being able to uh, understand more about electronic coupling. And I won't labor this too much, but this HAB parameter is a very important parameter because it tells us something about the relative extent of coupling. So here we find a value at 100, just over 100 wave numbers, which is relatively low and suggests that that radical is relatively localized on one of the thiazole thiazole ligands. We can also play this game computationally. So here we do the experiment where we either push the two ligands further apart, just over six angstroms, or we squash them further together uh, to around just over three angstroms. And what we find here is that this near infrared band has two components. In the, crisp, uh, the, uh, the real compound here, we see one is an intervalence charge transfer band, uh, which is due to uh, predominantly charge transfer from uh, the radical anion ligand to the formerly neutral ligand. And the other is an intramolecular transition. If we squash the two ligands further together, we retain these two transitions. But if we pull them further apart, we lose this intervalence charge transfer transition because they're now too far apart for the electron transfer to, to occur. What really struck me was just how subtle this can be. Although nature uses intervalence charge transfer to good effect, and it is indeed very subtle in nature, if we just change the, the distance between these ligands a little bit, and this is outside experimental error, and we move from a cadmium to a zinc, you can see here that the HAB for the cadmium system, which has an ever so slightly larger uh, cofacial distance, is about half of that in the zinc system. And this also changes the rate constant for electron transfer. So I want to talk about a really uh, recent paper that we just published. And this is a very similar framework with cofacial ligands, but now the cofacial ligands are tetrathiphorbolines. So what was interesting about this framework is just leaving it on the bench over the course of a few minutes actually changed the framework from the red coloration uh, to a colorless uh, color. And using crystallography, we were able to um, ascertain that this was due to a double two plus two photocyclization of these two, uh, electroactive uh, tetrathiphorbolene ligands. Now we could follow this using uh, powder X-ray diffraction, and we could uh, we could determine that we were uh, indeed altering the cofacial structure to the photocyclized structure, and we can also follow it using Raman uh, light irradiated Raman uh, spectroscopy as well. So here in particular, we can follow the carbon-carbon bonds at the back end of the TTF, and we can watch them as they. Uh, undergo that photocyclization and alter their vibrational frequency. And this is all conferred with computational uh, data as well. What is nice here is that if we heat this up a little bit, we can reverse this, and this is done at about 150 degrees, and we can cycle this around three times. If we try to do it anymore, we do see a uh, structural collapse uh, of the crystals. So 
what is interesting here is the connection really between this double two plus two photocyclization and the mechanical properties. And so here we have an AFM experiment. This is an in situ experiment under light irradiation. So this is a single crystal and quite conveniently, we have a couple of crystal planes, A and B, and we're just tracking the tip of the AFM across those crystal planes. So what you see, if you look at the height difference um, between A and B as a function of irradiation and time, is that there is a change in the height um, of the, the cleavage plane that changes around about 11%. So there's a mechanical um, property, if you like, uh, attached to that photocyclization event. Now, what is interesting is the connection between that photocyclization and the electrical and optical properties. So here we see the electrochemistry of the cofacial system itself, and we see the, uh, the TTF undergoing oxidation by one and two uh, electrons. We also see that characteristic near infrared then due to intervalence charge transfer. But when the system photocyclizes, what we see is that we actually lose, uh, we lose the, the radical character, if you like, of the tetrathiphorbolene, and there is actually no observation of intervalence charge transfer. Now, a little bit more recently, and in fact, the latest work that we're doing, I just want to give you a little bit of a taste to show you really where we're taking this. Um, Eleanor has been developing a library of these uh, ligands, and we've been able to crystallise quite a lot of them to try and develop some structure function relationships. So many of these photocyclides, in terms of, uh, or specifically the cadmium systems, photocyclides, and we've looked at, at also a longer uh, linker. So I want to just um, touch briefly on this aspect of the rate of photocyclization because we see a very striking dependence uh, on the nature of the uh, dicarboxylate coligand. And so here we use this light irradiated Raman uh, experiment to good effect. And I just wanted to show you the comparison of the uh, parent system, if you like, with the extended linker. And so what is interesting here, if we follow the percent conversion, that actually the, uh, over time, the conversion rates are very similar. But in fact, in the parent system, whilst we observe that intervalence charge transfer, and in fact, you'll note here that the uh, coplanar distances or the cofacial distances are very similar for both frameworks, but actually the slippage of the tetrathiphorbolines is quite different and it's much larger when we have this longer linker. And the upshot of this is, in terms of the uh, electronic properties of the system, is that for the shorter link, we have intervalence charge transfer, but as soon as that slippage gets too large and we lose the frontier orbital overlap, we no longer have that intervalence charge transfer. So we're, we're now really looking into this um, intimate connection between structure and electronic function. So just in the last couple of minutes, what I wanted to do was really just touch on a couple of applications of electroactive frameworks that we've been working on. And this has obviously already given us a, a beautiful overview of some of the incredible work being done around the world in this area. But just to, to show you really where we've been um, directing some of our energy. Uh, this is a, a really beautiful example of a honeycomb framework uh, first published by Brendan Abrahams and Richard Robson at Melbourne University. And in this beautiful material, which is in fact semiconducting, it's as synthesized state, the semiconductivity is attributed to the mixed valency not only of the iron, but also of the fluoranolate ligand uh, in this particular material. And so it's a mixed valence framework with semiconductivity. And here we've been quite interested in the potential application for uh, battery applications. And here is the example of using this material in an anode half cell. And we found quite a, a high, and this is all relative, a relatively high specific capacitance for this material. Interestingly, there is an induction period as we cycle, uh, cycle the, the anode, if you like, half cell. And if we look at the uh, voltage as a function uh, of, of uh, time and of specific capacitance, you'll note that actually there's relatively little variation over many, many cycles for this uh, material. So we're now moving down the pathway of really looking at the applications of these types uh, of, of electroactive and semiconducting uh, framework materials. 
The other um, application that I wanted to just touch on very briefly was, uh, and I'm just showing one core here of a framework that was first developed on a very elegant system from Saha's group. And we took great inspiration from this. This is actually an analogue of the MOF R74 or CPO structures that many of us know well. This is also based on electroactive uh, naphthalene diimide ligand, which using our solid state spectroelectrochemistry, we can demonstrate that we can reduce this ligand by one and two electrons, but we can also do this chemically. And if we do that, then what we find is that actually the heats of adsorption and even the selectivity of particular gas molecules, in this case, carbon dioxide over nitrogen, increases when we start playing around with the charge state of the framework. So really then to, to kind of bring everything together, what I hope I've been able to show you is that we've developed, if you like, our toolkit of techniques to really explore some of the fundamental aspects of, uh, of mechanisms of charge transfer in these materials. Uh, we've worked and we have some wonderful computational colleagues around the world who have been helping us to really try and understand the mechanisms in terms of hopping or band transport. And this is an area deserving, I think, of, of a lot of future attention um, to stand alongside experiment in this area. We've been very interested in mechanisms both through space, and I've shown you a few examples of through space um, mixed valency in this talk, but also through bond. Uh, mixed valency. And in our, uh, in our work, we're particularly interested in using these as models for electron transfer. The reason being that mixed valency is um, very inherent to many natural processes. And we think that, that metal organic frameworks are quite an important um, series of model systems for exploring biological processes. And finally, of course, if we can harness um, the electroactivity for functional applications, um, then really the world is our oyster. And I think this is why we've been um, so excited and interested in this area for, for many years now. So it just leaves me to thank, of course, all the people who have um, I've had the great pleasure of working with over the years. Um, and I'm sure that they have learnt, uh, or I've learnt far more from them than any of them have from me, uh, but I'm very indebted to them. And I've shown you their pictures uh, along the way of this presentation. Um, so thank you very much to them, to our wonderful collaborators, uh, to the funding agencies, all of the work I've talked about today has been supported by the Australian Research Council, to whom I'm very grateful. And thank you all very much for listening in from wherever you are around the world at the moment.